Uh, what I would like to do, as Paul was just saying, uh, and as we mentioned on Thursday, um, I would like to talk a little bit about types for program modules, which is a topic that has fascinated me pretty much my whole career, because it lies at the nexus of so many issues in programming languages that there's the subtleties uh, involved are, are really endlessly fascinating. And I want to, uh, I want to explain First of all, because I don't want to assume too much, I'm going to give an overview of what goes on with ML modules and try to try to isolate a few crucial points that you need that you need to grasp, like in order to get like what I will do technically. Uh, so I want to start out by talking about that. And here, as I think I mentioned on Monday in my original prologue to my lectures, I said that. Um, there are a bunch of heroes whose work I wanted to represent, and one of them is Dave McQueen. And so really the bulk of the credit for the design of the ML module system and from which the CAMEL module system is derived as well, is uh, it goes to Dave McQueen. And the thing I wanna emphasize is that, you know, is, is that the central idea in McQueen's design is dependent types. And, in this regard, it's been ML has been a dependently typed programming language since, and I mean this in a very direct, immediate sense, which I will outline in a moment, not in some loose analogical sort of kind of way, but in a deliberate and a deliberate and explicit kind of way, has been a dependently typed programming language with sigma and pi types right straight out of the box. Now, one of the one of the issues, in fact, if you you probably haven't, but if you were to study carefully the definition of standard ML, and then you were to study carefully the redefinitions of standard ML, which have been undertaken principally by Claudio Russo, and then later by um, uh, Derek Dreyer and um, uh, blanking on a name, it'll pop into my head in a moment, uh, and is, is on one side of it, and also uh, by myself and my students uh, and collaborators primarily here at CMU uh, have, uh, uh, have studied variations on this definition. And you might from a, from, a, from a distance wonder what that's about. And you know, the brief answer is uh, it's complicated. <laughs> There's a lot of issues at stake and especially if I go back to 1985, and particularly if I just think about my own ignorance at that time, uh, it's a miracle that I was even part of it and able to contribute anything, but very little was known, although I did have the benefit of knowing about dependent types at a very early stage because of Bob Constable's New Pearl Project at Cornell. So the, the you will not see in the definition anything that I would say is recognizably dependent types, but subsequent work by the two sort of, Andreas Rosberg is who I meant to mention, by the way, uh, the, uh, the subsequent work has made the type structure and its relation to known type structures very explicit. And there've been a number of takes on this and I won't be able to, uh, I won't be able to explain it all to you, okay? But I'm going to give you some idea of what informs it and where I think we are now. And I also want to advertise a little bit for uh, the work of my PhD student, John Sterling, with whom I've been developing a new theory of program modules. And in fact, a very substantial generalization of Reynolds's theory of parametricity, which is required to address program modules. You cannot do it with standard parametricity methods. And so uh, it requires, uh, taking account of not just relations, which are at most true, but structures. One has to have uh, evidence, the proofs of why something participates in a, as in a, uh, yeah, in a parametricity structure is important. So it's a general theme in constructivity is, is proof relevance. In fact, that's one of the things that Brouwer emphasized from its inception that was very controversial because he felt that if you want to prove a disjunction, it's relevant which just disjunct you're proving and you have to say so. And if you want to prove an, ex an existence, it's relevant the object that you're saying exists. And if you 
if you if you insist on that, then then your statements, your mathematical statements, are no longer propositions; they're types, because they have multiple elements. They're not just at most true. Whereas, from if I revisit that same principle from the point of view of um, classical accounts, and at that time championed by Hilbert, the in opposition to Brouwer, the, if you read the Van Heyenord volume, you'll see evidence of a basically a 1920s era flame wars going on there between the papers they wrote. Uh, the, in the classical setting, when you say or, you don't mean or. What you mean is they can't both fail. And when you say exist, you don't mean exist. You mean it can't be that it's always false. And the advantage, if you want to say it like that, of a negated proposition is that it has at most one proof. It's proof irrelevant. And this is the way to sort of, and this is indeed the way it was that, that Hilbert responded to Brouwer's suggestions. And so that led to a great misunderstanding. It was really a great misunderstanding. You can see that the two of them, like any proper flame war, the two of them were talking cross purposes and not really talking to each other. And uh, it's taken quite a long time before people have come to appreciate the significance uh and how to and how to harmonize the two positions and um, okay so this will come up a little bit toward the end of my discussion today so the thing i want to i want to start out with is i want to say a few things about mcqueen's design which was represented um in its original form and its inception in standard ml in fact i would say the most important thing about standard ml is a module system um, maybe I'm doing injustice to some things, but I, I'll go ahead and say that I think it's the most the most significant advance in the language, and and like any significant advances, it was uh, systematically ignored for a long time. So uh, I'm taking the opportunity to uh, to present it again uh, so people understand what's at stake. I think now people understand many more issues like dependent types. And therefore, it's easier to make the to make the to make the explanation. Okay, so McQueen's design for modules. The critical thing about a program module is that it integrates both values and types. If you want to think of it just in ordinary terms, in other words, you what you're dealing with are mathematical structures. They have a carrier. That's the terminology in math. Like a group has a carrier, and it has operations, uh, which is. Uh, 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 has operations like in the group operations, whatever they might be. And the the sort of structure you're talking about, the type of that sort of structure is called a signature. That's just the terminology that's used here, structures and signatures. I think that's not a bad terminology if you ask me. And uh, so that's the kind of starting point. And I want you to keep in mind a little bit, not that you would forget it, but I want to keep in mind that there are analogies to math and there are disanalogies to math. So that's what I want to get at. That's one of the things I want to get at. Because the thing that's distinctive is we know by now already through decades of work that you know very substantial bodies of math can be formulated very elegantly using dependent types. And that is what we're going to do here. We're going to substantial, we're going to uh, present substantial bodies of code that will be organized using dependent types. However, there is a difference between programming and proving, and I don't care. People make, I think, a, a, a grotesque overemphasis on this uh, on this uh, formal correspondence that I think should be has to be tamed. And the the thing is, is that there are a hell of a lot more computational phenomena than there are proving phenomena. You know that perfectly well. You can't print hello in a proof, <laughs> and you can't change the you can't change the value of a variable in the middle of a proof, because it's actually a variable in the sense of algorithmy. It's not some other damn thing which I called an assignable. But the point is, uh, so we have to take this into account, and this comes up in spades in connection with program modules, exactly because of this integration that these are kind of hybrid. I would I would describe it as. These are kind of hybrid entities. That would be a terminology. And one way to think about it is uh, in terms of uh, static and dynamic components of a module. 
That is that there are, there's a static part, which is the types, and there's a dynamic part, which are sort of the values, the computations, and the dynamic part is the thing that runs, that's why it's called dynamic. The static part is the thing that classifies, it participates in classification, and that's what you do at compile time. Now, by the end of this, I'm going to muddy those waters substantially because we've discovered in the recent months that there are uh, quite a subtle range of phase distinctions in play, but I'll start out with that one. So the classical one, and in fact, the terminology in connection with type theory is introduced by Moji around 1989, if I remember correctly, uh, in a workshop paper. And, uh, and this has been developed further uh, by Mitchell and Moji and I uh, around 1990, and that's been the basis for understanding the type theory of ML modules ever since. The idea of the phase distinction has been there right from the, ever since. And this will come into play here in the work we're doing. So the first thing is you think we have some kind of mathematical structure, something that looks like mathematical structures, and that these are then organized using dependent types. And in particular, the idea of a hierarchical structure, which you could think of like if you look in uh, oh, I don't know, you look at a vector space over a field, you can think of the scalars as somehow being subsidiary to the vectors, if you like, and you're building vectors on top of a field of scalars. So the idea of hierarchy of structure already, oops, excuse me, already exists, you know, in, the, in that setting, but it's, it's, it's something that comes up, you know, very commonly in dealing with program modules, and that's, these are expressed through sigma types. And the other thing that comes up is the idea of parameterization, and those are expressed using pi, those are expressed using pi types, which are generalizations of uh, function types. Uh, in both cases, if you're not familiar, I'll just mention that the sigma generalizes the cross and the pi generalizes the arrow, in that the domain type is sensitive to the value of the argument. Uh, so I can't teach you about dependent types from scratch. If, if you're not familiar with that, then I'm, I'm afraid you'll have to just get an impression. <laughs> uh, I can't, uh, there's only so much one can say. So, okay, so that's what I do. Now, the thing that is, I think, most important about McQueen's design is it's what I consider to be the definitive treatment of the coherence of combinations of program modules. The idea is you're writing code, you want to use a whole bunch of things off the shelf, whether it's stuff you wrote yourself last week or last year, or whether you got it from some library somewhere, whatever it is, you're going to, you're going to combine a whole bunch of things off the shelf and they have to fit together. And the naive idea of how to make them fit together is by parameterization and instantiation. This is the wrong idea. It does not work. I don't have time to substantiate that claim. It's been discussed elsewhere, uh, and you should uh, you might want to look that up. The important point is that what McQueen does is introduce something called sharing specifications, where I can say I can take a hash table and a dictionary that share a notion of key. And what you do, what I just said, that's pretty much exactly what you type in, word for word. You don't have to somehow anticipate that I'm going to be, that the hash table has to be, this is called the anticipation problem as a matter of fact, that it has to be parameterized by its key and that the dictionary has to be parameterized by its key because you don't know the future. You cannot tell in which ways I want to tie these things together. So the beautiful thing about McQueen's approach is it gives you a post hoc way of ensuring the coherent combination of modules. This is, in my mind, definitive. And outside of the ML family, you don't see it even used at all. Okay, and then the last thing I'll mention, which Dave didn't so much emphasize, is to enrich the setup with ceiling, which is used for data abstraction. And I won't have a lot to say about that today, but the, the thing I want you to understand as the takeaway is the purpose for ceiling is to have a compile time proxy for effects. I want you to remember that. So what's happening is when you have abstract types, one of the principal reasons you have abstract types is to distinguish at compile time, things that are distinguished at runtime by virtue of their effects. For example, if I have two different hash tables, 
even with the same keys and even with the same elements. They're different hash tables because they have implicit underlying state, which is different. The keys of one really shouldn't be presented to the keys of other of the other, even if that technically does make sense. In other words, they're the same key type. And the way you do this is by abstraction. And the there's the mechanisms for abstraction in ML are quite sophisticated. And as a matter of fact, that's the reason why we had to generalize uh, Reynolds's theory of parametricity to account for the representation independence properties of program module systems. So, uh, okay, good. So to some degree, I just want to summarize a few things. So let's just make uh, make an examples that anyone can can keep in their head. I admit that these are the very standard examples. So those of you who know all this stuff will find this boring, but I just want to fix our notation terminology a little bit so you can see where I'm heading. So the standard example is like a dictionary with keys. And the thing about the keys is that they have to admit an ordering. So I can have what is here, the signature order, which is a type class. This was present in ML in 1984 uh, and long anticipates other uses of the, of the term. Because the thing I want you to notice here is that this such a signature like this one, the reason to call it a type class is it's the class of types that admit a comparison, which I wrote here, compare, okay? And order is a type which tells you whether it's less, equal, or greater. Let me not worry too much about the details there. The point is, is if all you ever knew about a structure was this, you'd never be able to use it. Because how are you going to get a value of type T and how are you going to compare them? It, it doesn't make sense. Okay. What it is, is it's a description. So the point about type classes, there are two modes of use of signatures in ML, the descriptive and the prescriptive. And they're being illustrated here. Type classes are descriptive. Abstractions are prescriptive. Okay, so that's the thing that I want to say here. What I'm saying here, in contrast to order, is that um, is that this is all you're ever going to know about your dictionary. I'm prescribing what you get to know. And what you get to know is that there's a key, which admits a comparison operation. There's an element. There's a notion of a dictionary. And there are operations like lookup, which takes a dictionary and a key and gives you back an element option, let us say because it might not be there. So it tells you whether or not it found it. Okay, but it'll give you back that element. Now, the remark I made earlier about coherence, which will come up again, is I want to observe that there's no way a priori to know whether element or dict or key, not so much dict, but what, even dict, but especially key and element, there's no way to know which of those is somehow a parameter of of this abstraction and which is somehow a result or a part of the abstraction. You see what I mean? Because what I'm describing here are structures that have a key component, have a type element, have a type dict, have an operation like that. But in actual fact, when you go to use these things, you might want to think of it being parameterized and the sharing specification are a way to impose parameterization post hoc. So I'll come back to that in a minute. This is of the utmost importance. In fact, McQueen has shown you can get horrendous blowups in the size of code and grotesque uh, restructuring of your code that you don't want if you don't have these coherent specifications. So that I think is the, is the, the, the great in, innovation. So to give an example, I can make the standard ordering uh, on the integers, I called it int standard for that reason, just to indicate it. And the type T will be int, and I'm gonna use the built-in comparison function that is provided by the compiler in the language, let us say. However, the reason for this example is that I want to also say that I can present another ordering on the integers in which they are, they're ordered by say divisibility. I did it just, that's the thing that popped into my head when I wanted to write this example. And I could write some code here that says, well, the way you compare two things is you take y mod x and you make your decision based on that, okay? Whether one divides into the other, okay? So we can do this. And the thing I have in yellow here is an important point. Of course, there is no one true way to order the integers. 
And anything that forces that straitjacket on you is screwing you over. So I have a class of orderable type, types with a comparison, but I can implement integers can display that property in many different ways. So there's a many one and actually many, many relationship between signatures, descriptive signatures and structures that, for example, provide comparison operations in the manner I'm indicating here. So it's one of the, yeah, so that's the point I want to I want to make. This was inherent in the design from the beginning. There's no one true way to do it. You want to have both of these at your disposal at any time or any number of others. Of course, obviously, I'm doing something that fits on my on my screen here. But I want to be able to do uh, any of those at any time. And I don't want to have to, like, uh, to borrow a phrase from, from Greg Moore said, I, I don't want to be having to steer, steer the Queen Mary in order to somehow get access to both of these things. OK, that's like, no, that's like not the way to write code. OK, so I'll mention that. The other thing is, and here I think the uh, terminology has been, people have uh, criticized which is the idea of a parameterized parameterization of the implementation of a dictionary. And the terminology that's used is a functor. Um, it's not intended to convey anything from other use of the term functor, as in category theory, it not, doesn't really pertain to that. And it doesn't pertain to the use in logic programming. If you even know about that, it's just another thing. It's just supposed to mention, uh, call to mind the idea of a function. I think in retrospect, I don't remember anyone suggesting it, it might have been nicer to call it family. I have a family of dictionaries that are parameterized by the ordering on the key, the keys with their ordering and the element type. So maybe we should have called that family. But anyway, the NML is called a functor and I'm pretty sure you know, OCaml is called a functor. Uh, I could be wrong about that, but someone can check me. Okay, I think so. So, so that's why it's called that. Uh, we were, there was a lot of consternation about this terminology at the time, but anyway, nobody could think of a better suggestion. As far as I remember it, no one suggested family. So anyway, there we are. Okay, so the idea now is that I'm gonna implement a dictionary by just copying the given keys and the given elements. I just copy those down. This, this goes here and K goes here. That's a kind of a mess there, sorry. I can get rid of that. Uh, so the K goes here and the element goes here. So I just pull those down. And then I implement the operations in here. Maybe here's a simple thing. If I was setting up for a binary search tree, I might have a tree which is either empty or a node with two dictionaries and a key that tells you, you know, where you are and the ordering and everything to the left, et cetera, the, the usual kinds of things. Or maybe it'll be a red black tree, in which case it's also balanced. But anyway, that that's not important for my purposes. Okay. So I have some representation that can be done here. And now the other thing to say here is that the dict can be applied at will to any ordering that you want and any element that you want. There is no one true way to apply dict to integers. That's just erroneous. I can have a dictionary with integers ordered by divisibility. I can have a dictionary with integers ordered, the keys being integers ordered by the standard ordering or whatever, whatever thing I managed to cook up in my program. And so, uh, so that's important. So you get to write down any application whatsoever and you don't rely on any kind of back chaining or something, but I will mention that there, uh, you might see a paper called modular type classes, which, try, which shows, you could have a look at this by uh, um, uh, uh, Keller Chakravarti, a dryer and me from some number of years ago, I don't know. Uh, 10, 12 years ago, something along those lines. Um, and and uh, you might you might want to look that up, um, which tells you about how to integrate those ideas in a systematic way. Okay, and now I have an illustration of the of the sharing specifications. So I made this up. This is not probably not very convincing, but I sat here, I thought, oh, I don't know, I need something. So I do this kind of contrived example, but it, it is illustrative of the kind of thing that comes up which is that uh, I have a component of my system or whatever it might be. So that's why I call it component because it doesn't mean anything. And the, the characteristic of this component is for some inane reason, I have two different dictionaries. God knows why, but I do. But what's important to me is that they share the same notion of key. That's critical. 
Okay. And, and so, and how do you say that in, in ML? Uh, exactly that. <laughs> the nice thing about the, that aspect of the design is you say exactly what you mean. You don't have to go through some falderall of threading the common dictionary through the specification of the component and then making sure that when you basically do all the linking yourself, okay? No. I mean, that's what God gave us linkers for, okay? So let the linker worry about tracing down things. The important thing is that these be the same, and they're the same for the purpose of type checking. In other words, the type checker knows that that equation is a true equation by virtue of having said those. Okay, so that's the critical idea. Okay, so you could say we demand coherence declaratively rather than by forcing stilted constructions. And I know that'll sound like I'm not substantiating why I say stilted. It's just that it's been written down a number of times. And uh, I think it's even Pierce and I wrote it down in the advanced topics, types and programming language, a second volume of his book. <laughs> Uh, I think we wrote it down there. Some, uh, yeah, some uh, a summary of the kind of thing that goes on. Okay, so uh, so good. So that's the notion of a sharing specification. This is a situation where it's symmetric. By what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is there's no reason to think of one of these dictionaries being prior to the other. It's just. They're, they're both there and you just want to have two of them and you just want to make sure they agree on their notion of key. Presumably, if I have two of them, they maybe they have a different notion of element, but anyway, they must have the same notion of key because of God knows why I organized my code that way. So for some reason, okay, so I did that. So that's a, that's the thing that comes up here and it's very important. And then as I alluded to earlier, it avoids premature commitment to what are parameters and what are results. So that's what I was saying earlier. So as a matter of fact, you know, I can do things like this. I can define, for example, the signature of integer dictionaries as a dictionary. Now there's this notion of where type. And this is another notion of, of sharing, except that it's sort of intended to be asymmetric. Because what I'm doing here is I'm saying, I have a dictionary. A dictionary has a type component in called key.t. And I want to stipulate that key.t be equal to int. And therefore I'm classifying all the dictionaries whose keys are int. Or I can classify all the dictionaries whose keys are strings by specifying the key.t using this where type uh, clause that I have a dictionary whose keys are strings. And then I can implement them in such a way. So I call the dict int and int dict. So the idea is that dict int is, is, is uh, 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 what am I doing here? I forgot what I was doing. Oh, this has to do with, uh, excuse me, this is the keys. I could also do the same with the elements. In other words, after the fact, I can decide, no, no, it's, it's the element that I wish to specify. So I can classify all the dictionaries whose elements are in. So that's why I wrote it. I wrote it, uh, I wrote it as dictint, uh, sort of tongue in cheek. And so that's a dict where element is equal to end as opposed to key and or dict, dict string where the element is equal to string. And so the idea is I'm just, what I'm trying to say here is that with these where clauses or the sharing clauses, what I'm doing is, um, 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 using thumbtacks to nail things down, okay, in a post hoc manner, because the poor, poor person who wrote the dict library would have no idea what you need to do in the future. And you can, I hope you can easily imagine that the need to anticipate that kind of parameterization is impossible. There's no way to do this. And so these mechanisms, which I'm outlining here, I just uh, are. Uh, are of the are, are are of the essence that are really a very important part of McQueen's design, uh, original design. So I, I guess I want to emphasize that. Okay. Now, as soon as we have these notions, now here is a critical idea comes up. So as soon as we have these notions of sharing specifications of the kind I described, for example, like this. And as a matter of fact, you don't even have. Oops. Yeah, I'll, I'll erase it. You don't even have to write dot t there. You can just say the key structures are equal. But that's going to raise an interesting and uh, an interesting question, which is uh, a substantial part of of the type theory involved in talking about program modules. I'll just put that back because uh, uh, I'll just put that back. Um, let me get my pen back. Okay, good. And then I want to be there. Okay, so. Uh, 
okay, if I impose those equations, so the question is, then if, I, if, if, if such equations are imposed, if I wanna implement that component, those equations have to be true of my implementation. I mean, after all, you stipulated they have to be the same. So what it means is that this equation has to be true of your actual component. But now what I want you to notice is that keys, keys, these key structures contain both types and values, namely the comparison operations. They're hybrid entities. So now, what does it mean now to say, you would say, well, key dot T is equal to key prime dot T when key equals key prime. All right, you know, you're projecting from this thing and you have two projections. So you wanna know whether they're equal? Well, you say when the two keys are equal. Okay, good, except that, what do you mean by those? So the idea then is we come back to the phase distinction, which is the idea is that we wanna have compile time type checking and we want to have code be robust under changes of implementation. So a critical idea about modularity is it should help you maintain the viability of your code or the stability of your code under changes to implementations of things. Okay, so the point being then you don't want to have the types which are static notion dependent on the values which are part of the components of the key thing, which are a dynamic notion or a runtime notion, okay? And so the principle that is being applied here by the static and dynamic phase distinction is to say the type checking must be independent of code equality. That's the principle that is being, being put forward by this particular phase distinction. And I'll just say, this is one of many, and there's nothing that says this particular policy is the only one you should ever consider. In fact, we're considering lots more, but it, it's a primary one. And it's the one that's at the heart of the uh, ML module system. So I'll emphasize it. So the principle that's in there with the module system is that you must have type checking be independent of code equality. You shouldn't be going around comparing whether they are both the same comparison function at the very least, because as you perfectly well know, you're never, it's never gonna be able to figure that out. Okay, that, that, that's quite impossible. And so, and so uh, that would be one argument, but there are other arguments. Okay, so that's a critical thing. And I guess I don't want to develop this particular notion right now, but I'll just allude to it. Uh, McQueen also had a notion of structure sharing, when two structures should be the same. And it has to do with generating an abstract type that serves as a compile time proxy for the code that, uh, that is in that structure. And then you can define structure sharing in terms of this proxy. And that, that's a McQueen's original notion of structure sharing. And I'm not going to mention it further than what I just did right now, but just in case you've heard of it or in case you're interested, you can in fact allow it to depend on code equality. And McQueen's original design, which is in the version one of the definition, uh, uh, permits this. Okay, so, uh, but let me, uh, um, for now, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna do this, okay, because I can derive that notion using the mechanisms that I'm going to describe. I don't need to make special arrangement for it. So therefore, I'm gonna ignore it. Okay, so now, oh, and then this is, now this is the point I made earlier, but I wanna revisit it, which is what is the nature of abstraction? So one way to say it, which is the one I think is the, commonly understood is the reason for introducing some kind of notion of abstraction in a programming language is to impose on yourself strictures that maximize the modularity and flexible evolution of your code. In other words, you specifically by arrangement blind yourself to some facts which are true. So it can be that the keys in this particular dictionary are in fact structure, uh, uh, excuse me, strings, but you, you, you hide that from yourself or you hide from yourself that the dictionary is implemented as a two tree tree. Now, the only person who is doing this is you <laughs> are doing it to yourself. And the point is, yes, that is of the utmost importance. And I think I remarked earlier this week, 
that the whole point of a type system, what matters about a type system is precisely the strictures it imposes, not the affordances. So whenever somebody starts telling you, oh, you can do this, oh, you can do that, oh, you can do this other thing, oh, 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 oh you can also do this, oh, you can look at the underlying code. These are all failures of language design because they have robbed you of the ability to impose strictures so that you don't know that and then so that you can relax them in a controlled manner. This is completely lost. All of the energy behind untyped, so-called untyped languages, unitype languages, seems to me comes from, oh, you can do, oh, you can do, oh, you can do, or as I described it on discussion, anything you type in will do something, okay? And there's a certain kind of you know immediacy to that, which I think is appealing, but anybody who's written any halfway serious code knows perfectly well that that's like the worst thing in the world because you will never, ever, ever be able to maintain that code no matter what, okay? So, so that's because you have no idea who's depending on details that you think are negligible. There's no way to do this, okay? So those languages are a lose. I mean, for some reason we have to go through and relearn this yet again. I don't know why. I feel like we learned it with Lisp in the 1960s, but anyway, we're in the process of learning it yet again. And, and so anyway, I want to point that the, the, the key thing are the strictures. On the other hand, I also want to mention, maybe this is a little bit less commonly said, maybe not, I don't know, it's my impression. I could be wrong, is what I said earlier. Abstract types also serves as proxies for, for example, I should say, for example, because there are other, I can, there are similar things that can be done using abstract types. For example, I'm proxying for implicit state and saying that two hash tables uh, have the, are, their types are going to be different because the underlying state is different and I shouldn't confuse the keys. Because from the outside, if you just look at the type of hash table, one is as good as another until you remember that, oh yeah, but it also has underlying state. Ah, and now you realize, okay, they're not interchangeable. So abstract types are used to control that. And so the idea is these will be different abstract types and the type identity is proxying for the identity of the underlying state. So this proxy role is at least as important as the strictures role, or you could say it's all the same, I don't know what, but I felt like drawing this particular distinction because I, I, I find it uh, useful anyway to like bring, bring this out more explicitly. Okay, so, okay, so that's, uh, that's the point I wanna make here. Okay, so those are that's pretty much what I will have time to say about module system, you know, at a high level, giving you an overview of its design. So I wanted to, I wanted to call out like major points that uh, one ought to understand about uh, why things are the way they are, because I know when if I just show you some ML code and you have no prior experience, I think it is would be difficult to understand what's going on with sharing specifications and stuff. And, and I think it would be not, it's not like, I don't think you walk up to it and you know like what's happening. So there is there's something to be, you know, there's something to be said to explain like, why is it the way it is? And I'm, I'm gonna go so far as to claim that uh, uh, this is a risk and you can take it as an opinion and it's something that I may be embarrassed about, but in the future, but over decades, I haven't, found an occasion to doubt this, which is I feel it's a canonical design. It's as close as to a canonical design as you're going to get. There are things we've, we've changed and enhanced and modified, but these core structures that I'm explaining to you, feels to me are things that you really have to have and want to have. I could be wrong, but on present knowledge, I don't know of any better design, that's for sure. Um, and it hasn't come along in 30 years. So if you look at, in all the relevant points that I'm making here, at this level of detail that camel ones, standard ML one are the, are the same. There are differences, but at the level I'm discussing here, it's, it's basically the same, same principle. Okay, good. So now what I wanna do is, is take you from where we were uh, at, on Thursday as we we're developing some type system programming languages and I wanted to get across a bunch of ideas about language design and we ended up with talking about dynamic classification for keeping secrets and that, that, and that the notion of keeping secrets was uh, relevant to uh, proper handling of the management of exceptions. I shouldn't just handle because it has a technical meaning. Proper management of exceptions in your program 
to ensure modularity, okay? Because it's a colossal mess if in your component of some larger system, you use the exception error of string or something. And I used, you know, the exception error. Well, those aren't the same thing because you wrote your code with yours and I don't want yours to be confused with mine. And therefore this issue of secrecy of confidentiality and integrity comes into play. And so the dynamic classification was using that. Okay, that's just a brief reminder of like what we had gotten to on Thursday. So at the moment, uh, there is one thing I kind of want to say, maybe this is the right moment to say it, but let me just mention, first of all, so we ended up with the language design with kind of two levels where we distinguish the expressions of a type and the commands of a type. And they're linked together by the lax modality that says a command can be encapsulated into a value of the modal type. Okay, which would be, I called it tau comp in the first instance. I later suggested you could also call it tau command. Okay, so that was my account of what I called modernized algol. Okay, we got to that point. Okay, so that's what we were doing. And I arranged things so that expressions are pure and total and are characterized equationally because there's no reason to impose an evaluation order if you don't have any effects in the expression because you don't care. Now, issues of cost are another thing, but I'll come back to that because we have a way of dealing with costs via the phase distinction. So I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit later. So there's another notion of phase distinction. As I mentioned, they're sprouting up all over the place. So it seems to be an interesting, interesting idea that we, we're, we're pushing. Okay, so that's the structure we had and that we've developed so far. On the other hand, by the way, in contrast, the commands are executed by a transition system. And I didn't, okay, I didn't write that down here so before I turn the page. Okay, good. So I have, I have these two components and it might even say that I have three levels in a certain way, except they're quite trivial because the third level would be to tell you what are the types. But in something as simple as lax PCF, languages of that nature, I can tell you the types a priori. I mean, there is a note, once I have modules, then it's another matter, but the, uh, but I can tell you exactly what all the types are. And, and, and I don't, I didn't isolate it as some judgmental construct, but I'm going to need to do that in order to get richer. In particular, I guess I should have mentioned this. Uh, I have to think of when I should mention this point. Um, Uh, let me just say it as a sentence, and if I need to amplify this point later, or if you want to ask me, I will. Let me just say it right now. The idea of polymorphism that you find in ML or, and the idea of abstract type that you find are going to emerge as modes of uses of modules. So I'm not going to have any separate idea of polymorphism. It's only going to come up in terms of modules. You can think of a polymorphic function as a functor that merely takes a type or several types as parameter. And then it emits just a runtime value as output. So you see, you get polymorphism as a special case. And abstract types, you know, blah.t, you know, dick.t or something will also emerge out of the mechanism of the module system. So that's kind of, uh, kind of something implicit here. But the reason I brought it up at this moment was I could just tell you the types in advance because everything else will arise once I have modules by abstract types. That's what I'm trying to get at. So I'm giving you some built-in types, some function types, product types, a bunch of things, and I can just say them up front. So you might say there's a, a third level. You could say there's a third level, but in something like PCF, so this should, could might this might say three, okay. But in something like PCF, it's rather simple. So I want to, I want to, uh, uh, okay. Anyway, uh, I've said that. Okay, good. So, so the other point that I would like to make is that in a certain like technical sense, the way you, you should think of a language design is to start with what I'm going to show you. And I struggled last week um, to figure out how I could teach you the things that I wanted to teach by starting with modules, because this is the correct way to do it. Everyone who does language design, it seems to me, first puts together some bunch of things that they think is useful. And then, oh yeah, you know, I don't know, down the road we'll do some module something or other. Okay, 
is completely the wrong idea. Okay, decades of, of experience tells you that. However, pedagogically, I can't do that. So that's why I'm proceeding the way I am because the pedagogical order is often not the mathematical order. And so, uh, so I'm, that's, that's what I'm doing here. But really, I ought to have started everything with this. Okay, so what we're going to do in order to make all of this fit together into a grand picture, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a type theory in which everything is a signature. That is, there is nothing else but signatures. And, and then I will be able to recover the things that I've told you about so far, the types, the values of a type, the computations of a type will be, will be uh, how should I say, isolated from structures via their signature. So certain degenerate forms of modules will correspond to runtime code. Certain degenerate forms of modules will correspond to types. And in, but in general, uh, modules are combine values and types together and computation together. So there's this idea and the, the jargon that goes with this is that what I'm going to explain here is what is called a, a synthetic account of modules in which I start out by saying everything is a signature. The only types that are, are signatures and then I isolate, I find the other things that have are of interest as described here will be isolated as modes of use of this structure, of this architecture. That's what I mean, okay? So, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna de describe to you a dependent type theory in which the types are signatures. I'll use the word signature. And there's going to be some basic ones, the atomic signatures, where, which are outlined here in the bottom of the page. There's gonna be a signature called type and for each type, there's going to be a signature called elements of that type. I could have called it values of that type. So the idea is that in something like ML, when I say type T, what I'm really saying is uh, that I have a structure that implements the signature type. And this is precisely the notion of a universe in type theory. So if you've run across dependent type theory and you've been studying it, at some point, you're going to run into the notion of a universe. And Recently, you would, you would run across it in connection with the idea of a univalent universe, which I'm not gonna talk about here, okay? But here, it's a, there's this idea of a, of a universe. So what's happening is you can say, this is the signature, which is the universe of small types, that is types of the underlying programming language. Okay, so in this regard, you can think of signatures as being types that are built from the universe upward. That's kind of a way to think about it. They're the second tier of types as opposed to the first tier, which include bulls and arrows and stuff. Although I'm gonna show you something about that in a minute. And then if you know about dependent type theory, one formulation of dependent type theory, there are many, but one formulation of dependent type theory distinguishes the type of elements of a type where tau is, is an element of universe of type. Okay, so you say, a lot of times people then just elide the word EL and just write tau. And I understand that and I'm not gonna quibble, but it, it, it's helpful for me in terms of explaining my thoughts that I have two atomic signatures, the signature of types and the signature of elements of the type. So that's how I'm going to recover the underlying programming language out of my module system. So I'm trying to kind of press this point that my language is a module system. That's my programming language. Then I will populate that module system with constructs of interest, like maybe, oh, I don't know, dynamic classification. Okay, that's the thing I wanna get across. So classified will be an element of the universe of types, and then the elements of classified will be the things we talked about, talked about in Thursday's lecture. Okay, so that's, the, that's the, what I wanted to teach, but I didn't manage to figure out how to do it in that order. So I'm, going, I'm doing it backward because I think it's more helpful pedagogically. Okay, so now let's look at how we, what are structures? So structures are elements of dependent sums. So these are written like this. It's an infix notation that, you know, S colon S1 cross S2. This would be the sigma S colon S1 dot S2 that you see in many accounts of type theory. Uh, this is the new Perl notation. It's far nicer to use on the page. Okay, and if you just suppress this, then you get the ordinary uh, Cartesian product. So it's a special case. So the idea is that the product is formed of a, 
uh, uh, I didn't mean to do that. The product is formed of a signature and a family of signatures indexed by the elements of the first one. So that's critically important. And the elements are pairs, and that's the introductory form, and the elimination form are projections. So these are how you get the components. Key.t is a projection of the T component, okay, which here in austere notation is dot one and dot two, but in a more realistic thing, you'd give them names, okay? And the important thing to see is what's in yellow here which is that modules, which contain both type components and value components, make their way into signatures. So this is the thing, and these threaten the phase distinction. So the reason that modularity is not merely dependent type theory is exactly because of the phase distinction. So that's what I'm going to explain. But before I do that, let me just allude briefly to the idea of uh, dependent product sig signatures. So functors are elements of a generalized dependent function space, also called dependent product, maybe I should call it dependent. If I call the other one sum, then I call this product. Sometimes the sigma is called product, in which case this is called function. As I, I don't know, it's a terminological snafu. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, there we are. Okay, so I call the dependent product in this case, and it's the dependent function type. And it has the same characteristics that you they induce uh, the mixing of values with types. Okay, so that's important. Modules find their way into types. So they threaten the phase distinction. Okay, so now I want to keep going now and show how we then start to arrive at, I'm not able to monitor the chat. I'll, I'll look at it after it, uh, my mind. I'm, I have to be fix, fixed on what I'm doing here. Uh, so I'm not ignoring you, but I'll have to come back later. Okay, uh, so the uh, the initialization, now I wanna mention other forms of signature, which is the signature, sigma command or sigma computation. The idea being uh, modules have to be initialized. I mentioned to you, you could have a module, which is a hash table. The hash table has to be initialized by allocating the table. So I have to have a notion of a signature, a command signature, a computation signature, which signals the impurity, which the initialization, which is what the initialization is inducing. Okay, and then I can consolidate the, the type structure. So the nice idea here is that the elements of the function type are functions in the sense of signatures. This is a, uh, this is a, a functor in the module terminology between the elements of tau and the elements of tau two and so on. And we can write them out like that. Okay, I don't have time to dwell on this any further, but I just wanna say this is part of the way in which we say every single thing is a signature and the underlying type structure that you normally would think of as being given first or given you know, prior is not really given prior. It emerges from what I'm doing with signatures. That's a critical idea. So that's the synthetic account that we're doing. Okay, so now the cool thing is the phase distinction and how we're gonna manage it. And we manage it by having what's called a subterminal signature. And in the paper, relevant paper here, we used, oops, I'm sorry. We use this particular notation which uh, in, my, in my poor handwriting, that looks like a padlock. <laughs> it's a lock substatic, which is a, the static lock. And the idea is, is that the locks, uh, the locks are kind of propositions. They are signatures that are at most inhabited, or one can say at most true. That is any two elements of them are equal. Okay, so that's the idea. And so what we do is we introduce this idea of a static lock. And the, the intuition is, if you possess the static lock, then you're in static mode. And then I will say what that means in a moment. Okay, and then there's a static modality, which is written here, which is circle S, which is, if you have the static lock, then S. Read the arrows in implication. That's a function, a functor, a module level function that takes as an argument evidence that you own the static lock and delivers back a, a, a structure of signature S. Okay, so here's the thing I wanna get across. I'm feeling a little pressed for time. The point of the static lock is that it coarsens equality. Because you see, when I have the static lock, what I'm going to say is the dynamic parts of the module don't matter. So when I say key dot T is equal to key prime dot T, I'm gonna compare key to key prime possessing the static lock. And when I possess the static lock, key and key prime 
tend to be equal more often because I'm going to disregard the code that does the comparison. Okay, that's the idea. So this, this idea corresponds to the notion of an open, uh, which you may have heard about. Uh, I, I won't, never mind. I'll come back to a little bit later. Okay, so we're going to have a notion of equivalence of both modules and, sig and signatures because they're intermixed, which we'll call static equivalence, which is mean, which means equivalence in the presence of the static lock. You have you have your you have the you, you have the static lock with you. And then the important thing, as I just alluded to, is in the presence of the static lock and only in the presence of the static lock, any two comp elements of a type tau and any two modules which are uh, a command are equated. In other words, the runtime effects, the yeah, the runtime effects and the runtime behavior is not relevant to you when checking static equality. This is how you get compile time type checking. And although I don't have the moment to explain it here, this is counterbalanced by the use of data abstraction as proxies, as compile time proxies for identity of code. Um, I'm I'm sorry, I can't explain that uh, in in detail at the moment, but it is it is another point that I could make here. So that's what we do. And then we have the notion, how do we account for sharing? Well, it's an idea that actually came from cubicle type theory. So what's kind of nice is that uh, this is an example of where, you know, I hate to say it, 10 years of work uh, on higher dimensional type theory is starting to bear fruit. Although it wasn't where, where anybody thought it was going to come out, but we realize now we have this idea. So in higher dimensional type theory, you have the idea of, a partial square like this one, I have three edges and you fill it in like that. It's called a filler or a composite. Okay, that's the thing you do. So you have a, a partial specification, okay, of a of a square. And then you say, give me a square that, sat, that agrees with that specification. So a similar thing happens here, except we're not talking about dimensionality. We're talking about the static lock. So this is the signature of modules whose static part agrees with them. Because if you have the static lock, then it's equal to M. And the rest of it, I don't know anything about. You can do whatever you like. You can have whatever runtime part you want, but the static part must agree with what I say. So it's extending, it's, it's the, all the modules that extend this N as regards the static part. It has to agree with them on the static part, but it could be anything on the dynamic part. That's, that's the idea. So it's the set of modules that agree in the following way, and then we can, use this, to, for example, to express a single type. So I can have a module M, which is actually nothing other than a type, such that statically that type is equal to tau. And that's the notion of a singleton type, which was studied by my former PhD student, Chris Stone, who did his PhD on singleton. And it was a study of how you could use them for doing type sharing and also cross-module inlining. I'll come back to that a little bit later. Okay, so that's the structure extension types are important. Okay, so that's the, I think that's where I want to stop. I want to summarize a few other points, but I am running out of time, I believe. I've, I've gone for about an hour, if I'm not mistaken, and I might have another 10 or 15 minutes. Paul, someone can, can you remind me? I, am I correct? I think I've gone for an hour and I probably have 10 or 15 more minutes. Does that okay. make sense? Someone should tell me. I'm asking. I'm querying. I'm not asking to have that. I'm asking whether I do have that. Yeah, we can start. Uh, next lecture is at two, so you still have ten minutes if you want. Okay, to. I won't go that long. Okay, but I'll, I'll. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure. I, I started to feel pressed for time, so uh, uh, I wanted to make sure I didn't step on the next person. I think it's uh, uh, Justin Shu possibly, but anyway, I don't want to step on the next person toes. So uh, let me make sure I, I do that. Okay, so uh, so we talked about, so I gave you a brief idea about extension signatures. So kind of in, in summary, the structure that, that we have here that we develop is we have a universe of types. We have, a, which is a signature. We have the signature of the elements of a type. We have the signature of the computations or effectful commands of a signature S. And then we have the extension type the things that under the static lock agree with uh, some module M that I specify. So we can write it like that. And then we have the dependent product and the dependent 
function type or dependent sum and dependent product, depending on, depending on the mood I'm in or depending on who you're talking to, which terminology it is. It's, and, and we have that, and that's the architecture. So this is the, this is the, I would call this the top level or the outermost architecture of a programming language. Because you see, I can say, I get to say, uh, because I haven't really told you what are the types and I haven't told you what are the elements. I get to populate that according to what I want to do. But the thing that I want to stress, which I did say earlier, but I want to re re-emphasize, the way you design a language is you start with the module system. Okay, that as you know, okay. That's my harangue, okay. Uh, decades of experience tells me that this is the way, the way to do it. And then I'm gonna explain some little few other things that are germane to this, but I'll get to it. Okay, so then I can start telling you what types are and I tell you what the elements are. Oh, that's all the boring stuff that you actually write code about. Okay, so that, <laughs> that you use to write code. Okay, it's tongue in cheek, but I'm just trying to say, and dependent type theory is the key to all of this. And where do the dependencies arise, by the way? Right here. It's the fact that I have a signature that specifies something about a module. That's the point where the dependencies come up. Okay. Or the other spot is in tau, because tau is nothing other than a module. I wrote tau because it looks nice, but a module whose type is the universe, I prefer to write that tau because well, you're used to that. <laughs> so it's a notational convention, but it's a module of signature type. So that's another spot where the dependency. So the dependencies arise here and arise here. And then inductively, of course, but in terms of the primitive points where the dependencies can arise, then it's tau and m here. And then that's why we need the dependent cross and the dependent arrow. And then these are otherwise standard dependent type theory. And that was, uh, in McQueen's original design. He had a paper in 1986 called Using Dependent Types to Express Modular Structure. Uh, it didn't address the equality issue very, very substantially. And a lot of the work that went on subsequently had to do with that. And it also didn't address the abstraction issue, but, or effects if I remember correctly. But anyway, it was the, it was the key insight that said what you want are dependent types. Um, and so, so that was, uh, at present at birth, if you will, and uh, in standard ML back uh, 30, 35 years ago or something like that. Okay, good. So um, so that's the, the architecture that we have. And now I wanna say a few things about this, okay? Oh, oh, right, the other thing, I forgot the central thing is the phase distinctions phi. These locks, these phase, I'm gonna now, Use, the, use it plurally, the phase distinctions. So right now we have only the static lock, but there's a lot more coming up. So that's what I want to, what I want to mention. So the last form of say, well, that's three stick. So the seventh, if you will, form of signature is a phase proposition. Okay, so that's what's going on there. Okay, so now what I want to say, so let me write that in ink as it were. So we'll put phi here, which is a phase proposition. Okay, good. So I want to make sure we do that. Okay, so now I, here I just maybe want to just advertise a little bit that there's a bunch of work going on, which shows that these phase distinctions come up all over the place. And I'll just mention the ways in which we're using them and work going on at CMU at the moment uh, with my students and I um, and postdoc is, um, uh, uh, are these. So the static and dynamic one is, is, I guess, in my way of thinking, at least in terms of the lambda calculated type theory, the original phase distinction was the static and dynamic one. But we've also, as a paper we have under review at the ML workshop, which is about uh, another one, which is a phase distinction between compile time and static. And the idea is that I want to relax abstraction during compilation so that I can support cross-module inlining. You see, this idea that you impose strictures on yourself so you specifically prevent yourself from knowing certain things in order to enhance the maintainability, reusability, modularity of your code. That can count against you in terms of efficiency, but not if you have a way of managing it, such that at compile time, you can coarsen the equality to propagate more information about what's going on, including the identities of the actual code components of a structure. And this was studied in a nation form by Chris Stone, 
but not in this form. So we've seen this emerge as a notion of a phase distinction. And uh, a number of years ago at the ML workshop, I gave a talk about what to do about data types in ML, because I think those are forms of signature. And let me just leave this alone. Uh, the whole business about data types, I think, and ML should be ripped out in favor of modes of use of modules. And in order to make that, I talked about that at the ML workshop, I don't, I don't remember uh, some number of years ago. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, this notion of phase distinction makes that practical. So that's the thing I, that I'm interested in. So that's the thing that's going on. Another that I alluded to earlier is the distinction between behavior and cost. And here's, here's the simple idea. If I give you merge sort and I give you insertion sort, they're not equal as functions. They're, they're oh, here's what I wanna say. They're not equal as algorithms, but they are equal as functions. In other words, they both implement sorting. Their IO behavior is the same. You give them a sequence of some random junk and it emits the same random junk in sort or order in either case. However, they've obviously, and I chose the example for this reason, they have different complexity. They have different notion of cost. So using this idea of the phase distinction between behavior and cost, then we are developed a type theory for verifying intrinsically the notion of cost of a program and, uh, and then are able to integrate that with the program's behavior satisfying a specification. And this is the, will be the PhD thesis of my student UA and EU. And he's working as we speak, I hope, or I think. Uh, and uh, that will be coming up. Finally, another one that I'll mention that we're developing at this moment is, is the information flow security. Of thinking of the levels of the security levels, which are normally associated with uh, you know, these kind of information flow type system are actually phase distinction because the idea is the lower the security level, the more things are equal because all the secret things are obliterated and they're equal to star. You can't see them, they're a black box. So it's a natural that if the phase distinction, the possession of a lock means equality is, is coarsened, then you can use the same idea to, to say, well, possession of a, a lock at a level is uh, going to coarsen my equality. And then the, we're studying the, the relation to this and the uh, dependency core calculus. So if you know about that, some of you probably have studied these things and know about the DCC by a body, uh, 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 body Heinz, Ricci, and uh, uh, I think um, I'm missing someone, uh, excuse me for missing it, the name will pop into my head. But anyway, you may know about the dependency core calculus and um, uh, it's sort of related to that. So it turns out the phase distinctions abound. So there, there's an interesting thing. Okay, now at the very end, I think I've alluded to this already, which is the idea of parametricity structures. And I alluded it to, her, to, it, to it earlier, but I'll just mention it in a very tiny bit more technical way uh, because I just want it to resonate with things you may know that you already know. So you know that the Reynolds' theory of parametricity is based on the theory of logical relations which derives from Tate's method of computability. Okay, that was introduced by Tate in the 60s. Um, in fact, Sterling's PhD thesis is about the generalized Tate computability. That's the terminology he uses. He calls it synthetic Tate computability in the same sense of synthetic that I alluded to earlier. Um, okay, so I wanted to promote his work. So. Okay, good. So uh, small types. Uh, so the idea is that when you have only small types around, what I'm calling small type, the programming language type, then you can use logical relations to talk about the parametricity or representation and dependence property. And the key thing is that the, the relations have an act, type constructors have an action on relations. So the relation associated with arrow is the arrow of the relation. The relation associated with the cross is the product of the relation. And then these get to be defined. All right, so that's just a, a thought. And this is on relations that are at most true. These are subterminal. And but the problem is if you try to extend this to large types, but if you have a universe, then you have a problem because the elements of the universe have a dual personality. The elements of the universe are like computations that when you run them, you know, are element are values of the universe. So they're like types. But the elements of the universe have a distinguished role because 
they also classify other things. You see, when I have the elements of the type NAT, I just have the numbers, that's all there is to it, I have the numbers. And the computability or the logical relation has to say something about their numeric behavior, okay? But when you have the elements of the universe, they have a double role, which is the, uh, as I say, as elements of the universe, just like any other type, but they also are themselves classifiers. And in order to manage this, you need not logical relation, but logical structures, uh, because relations don't go far enough. And if you look as a paper on my webpage that's to appear in JSCM uh, called uh, uh, Logical Relations as Types, and, uh, and then it's applied to program modules. So you can, you can have a look at that there. And in fact, that's the origin. That's where, what got us thinking and the directions that I've been outlining for you here uh, just now. And if, you're, if you know about such things, what's happening is the relations correspond to opens in a space and the structures that we're doing and these uh, correspond to sheaves and a topo. So this is the, the, what's really happening here is that the way you go from proof irrelevant to proof relevant is passing from opens to sheaves. And that's what's going on under the hood. So if you look at the parametricity structures and the development, it's all grounded in sheaf theory actually. And, and that's where that comes from. So uh, good. So that's what I wanted to, what I wanted to say. Um, I'm happy to entertain questions in so far as we can manage that in, uh, in the time we have. And otherwise we can pick up further on Slack and um, thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. <clears throat> so I'm happy to entertain questions and please do not hesitate to ask you know, um, a dumb question. Okay, just go ahead, one. please. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder uh, why the sum types are missing among those that are available to, to compose uh, signatures. We can only yeah, use so I, dependent. What will happen is, yes, there were no yes. non, non dependent ones. What will happen is, uh, I will have this, and this will be which will be uh, axiomatized independently of so axiomatized directly, if you will. And the typical thing is, if we think in terms of equations, we'll have the beta-like equations, but not the eta-like equations. And the same thing goes with inductive types. If I have mu t tau, these are positive. So the idea is that the positives, we don't have positive signatures, are elements, you know, elements of some type tau. That's the way we deal with the positive types. So I think that's what you're getting up. So that's that's what that's the way this emerges. So we don't have a signature of natural numbers. We just have, well, we do. We have the signature of the elements of the small type of natural numbers, which is axiomatized directly. So that's a different scenario because you see, I was saying, if you do this, I just make that be the functor signature. But if I do elements of nat, well, elements of nat are just what they are. I don't. I don't get them, so to say, for free by passing to something I already needed for modules. I instead tell you what they are. So that's that's what's happening. So that's the architecture. Thanks for asking that. Okay, it's a, maybe a dumb question, but can't you say that natural numbers classify all of the natural numbers with those less than and greater than uh, as an order? Uh, maybe it's a really stupid question. I'm sorry, but uh, yeah, uh, can't we say that? I mean, isn't that a reasonable uh, description of a natural number? Um, I'm not quite sure I understood the question. Uh, my okay, maybe, apologies. Maybe, maybe it's the wrong. Maybe it's just a question. Sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can I jump in with a question from chat? Yep. Um, so the question yeah, there, from there have been a lot, but I, I'm sorry. I was too like in the groove <laughs> here. So, okay. I've tried to answer most or collect the ones that weren't answered. So okay. uh, one from Hannah Lung mm -hmm. is, uh, what's the one sentence summary of the essence of the module problem? It's a matter of uh, controlling the tension between separability and integration, separation and integration. You have to integrate a whole bunch of components to build a, uh, to build a software system, but you want to keep them as separate as possible so they can be evolved independently one another and reused in the forms of libraries or other kinds of code sharing. And the entire problem is managing that tension. It's a fundamental tension.
And types are all about that. The whole point about types is to is a theory of composition. Oh yeah, that's the thing I might throw in when I mentioned about behavior and cost. What we're able to give is a type theory for talking about cost, which means we have a theory of composition that is lacking in theory A side when you talk about complexity of algorithms. Each algorithm is a, a world unto itself. There's no others in the world. You just study that exact algorithm in isolation. They don't have a theory of composition because they don't have a theory of type because they're not based on lambda calculus, so they have no hope. All right, I'll throw that out there as a squib. <laughs> Hannah Leary, I guess that was your question. So, okay, good, thank you. Best starting point. <laughs> yeah, PFPL supplemental modules. I handled, I handled them differently than I do right now as I've done here in the book because the two ways of handling them roughly are using the phase distinction in the manner I'm describing here, which I think is now I feel very confident about because there are many phase distinctions. The alternative is to do what is called phase separation. And that involves tearing modules apart and isolating the type parts and the value parts. And that's what was done in the definition. And that's the kind of thing that is done in the paper called effing modules. Okay, if you know about that. Um, and the thing is the distinction between the static and dynamic phases can be handled by this re-architecting your program, but not these other phase distinctions that doesn't apply. There's no similar thing. So now I feel very certain that this is the right way to do it, but I didn't know that you know, two years ago. So, uh, so this is something that has, you know, something that's going on, okay. Could I jump in with another question from chat? Uh, so this There's one's what? from, Car mm -hmm. another question mm -hmm. from chat. This one's from Carlos Tomei. Um, the question is, how does polymorphism, predicative or impredicative, at the level of small types, fit in the framework? Well, uh, 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 as a, the, the way you can do that is it's, it's quite easy to uh, introduce a, a small type, which is uh, whose elements are encapsulated modules of a signature. There's no issue in, there's no issue in doing that. That's easy. In fact, you can say an existential type is simply a small type that encapsulates structures. And this can be, I, I don't want to write it down off the top of my head here, but you can do that easily. There's no, no difficulty with that. <clears throat> About the cost thing you mentioned and complexity analysis, yeah. how do you, um, write down the cost for like substitution. It seems to have, I guess, variable cost. You have to sort of look uh, at how many Okay, so part, part of what is going on and what we're doing is you, you get to define your notion of cost. And the idea is that when you think about like an algorithms class, people will measure, like they'll tell you the complexity of a sorting algorithm. And they, the measure in question is not something like some instruction steps, it's the number of comparisons. Or you'll have some graph algorithm or something or other, and they'll say, we're going to, the figure of merit is going to be the number of edge inserts. So what we do is we have a way of specifying whatever those abstract, whatever you want to count, you count. And that's what is meant, okay, by the cost. And so that, that's, that's what we're doing. So therefore, that kind of question doesn't come up. Okay, that, that's the, uh, I feel... I feel good about that because I think that's a better way to talk about complexities in terms of these abstract cost measures rather than concrete ones. <clears throat> I have a question about this in relation to like standard presentations of, you know, univalent MLTT. Um, okay. Is the presentation of like modules as dependent types and their phase distinctions here, like introduce more strictures or, or more sort of like a fine grain notion than those standard presentations? Well, what I'm doing with the static and dynamic phase distinction um, it is, you know, as I mentioned, it's about coarsening the equality and it's not something you would want to be using for standard math where the, the analog of the runtime things are your proofs. 
So I don't want to do that. Okay. On the other hand, you know, the side effects of partiality and, you know, whatever else you have in your programming language are not something you want to be doing in your proofs. So that concept doesn't apply. So, um, so that's like one thing I can say. So that when using dependent types for program modules, you want to, we're using these, these subterminals to control the coarsening of equality to manage that distinction. Okay, and then so other just it's equally compatible with other distinction and there's no real you know things can be integrated in quite a substantial way okay so then somehow these distinctions and like the lock type is different <clears throat> than um like just like like type, type truncation or something like that where you're like moduling out is that uh, i didn't i didn't catch the last thing it's a sort of an add-on this idea of the these opens, these subterminal types is sort of an add-on, if you see what I mean. Not yet. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Can I jump in with another question from chat? Okay. Um, so this question is, uh, does this framework, uh, it, oh, it's from uh, Gabriela Araujo Brito. I hope I'm getting that right. Okay. Uh, the question is, does this framework allow for user-defined phase distinctions? Or do this have to be hard coded into the programming language? No, they, the whole the whole I, well, what I just presented to you, I, I made one use of the phase distinction, which is the classical one. But the theoretical apparatus that we've developed and are developing is quite compatible with many choices, many varieties of phase distinction. And as the ideas mature, I anticipate that you'll be able to introduce them yourself in all the programming language in which you can do this. But I can't say that this has been accomplished, but the, the semantic framework, uh, you know, uh, that's what it suggests. Uh, that our understanding of the, of the underlying semantics points us into what should be doable. So that's what, that's what I can say right now in present, present understanding. Uh, somebody asked about papers. So the parametricity structures on my 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 home page. I believe there's a three page paper about the the one that I mentioned with cross module inlining. I don't remember whether I put it on my home page or not, but it's under review. That would be there. Uh, and then for for the dead obvious reasons, there will be a couple more coming up pretty soon uh, that I'll put on my home page uh, that describe some of the things I mentioned to you earlier. As a matter of fact, Harrison's working on one of them. Okay, I got a few more questions <clears throat> queued up. Um, first one is from Evan Bergeron. I hope I'm getting that right again. Um, the question is, oh, I just lost it. Ah, here we go. How would you replace SML data types? Is there some suggested reading on that topic? Uh, there might be a talk on my webpage. There was anyway about this. It was a talk I gave at ML Workshop I can't actually remember how long ago, bet between five and 10 years ago. <laughs> uh, but the, the, idea is, the idea is the following thing. Um, you probably are aware if you used ML that there's this highly annoying thing about data types occurring in signatures and data types occurring in structures. And this is like, this is not what you want, okay? So the way I propose to do it, it goes like this. You have, an, uh, you have a notion of a signature, and let me do, I don't know, a list, which might be a data type, that's why I use it. And it uses something called the data signature. And the idea of a data signature is it provides an interface to the pattern compiler. So what I will do is I will say, let's just say for now, for simplicity, I just have a type of list and of numbers just so that I can get this uh, easily. And then you say constructor nil is a list, and you say constructor cons, let us say, takes NAT cross list and gives you a list. And that's called a data signature. And the keyword, the, the keywords here, the data and the con, by calling these things constructors, what is happening is under the hood, the compiler is generating a case analysis, which is the interface to the pattern compiler. Okay, now here's the fun part. So how do I implement this thing? Well, I can say, give me the default implementation. And how do I do that? Well, I want to give you something. I want to, I leave left space there for a reason. I want to give you a list module, which implements the list signature. 
And, but I, I don't want to implement that myself. I want to take the default thing. So, so what I do is I write data structure. Okay, I love the pun, excuse me, but I do. So you write data structure, list, colon, list, and you write nothing over here. All right, there's nothing that goes there because what you mean is implement this in the default way. The constructors are the generators, make an inductive type or a recursive type, make the case analysis thing, and that interface is the pattern compiler. Why does it interface? Because the list has a, has a data signature. That's the high level idea that like there are other things to say, but the, at a high level, that's the idea. The nice thing is it should also be possible to provide non-standard implementations of, uh, of data types. So I can give a data type in which I implement, oh, I don't know what, just to be perverse, let's say a list is a natural number and I do some cockamamie pairing function and something, you know, big number, you know, something like this. I mean, I could do it, not that you would want to, but I could. And the idea is it should still interface with a pattern compiler. So I ought to be able to say, and then there's gonna be an issue which I'll mention, uh, I'll say my list, which also has a data signature, except I get to implement it myself. So right over here, that would, be, that would be the idea. So I have to write code that provides the, the hooks so that I can interface to the pattern compiler. And there's one issue you have to worry about, which is totality. And because this arrow in ML by default would be a partial function. And I could write my own cons that like calls my grandmother and then you know emits some list or maybe diverges according to the phase of the moon. And now you've screwed everything up because you can't optimize patterns and stuff anymore. So what we need is an ability to express totality, which is why in these lectures, I emphasize having a modal distinction between the pure things and the impure things, because I anticipate this is where I want to go. So that's the that's the inside baseball there. So the uh, so the the what we're doing the proposal in that paper is to use a this compile and static phase distinction to uh, control the cross module inlining so that for example I can open code the constructors and open code the case analysis so that anyone who uses it can inline all that. That's the idea, and so. If that can be made to work, then this idea will be will be completely it will be made to work, and I think it cleans up the language enormously to be able to do this. Could I jump in with a follow up, actually, briefly? Yep. Yep. Wouldn't you have to know that nil and cons here are injective? Otherwise, how would you be able to do the destruction? That's an, that's an, that's another issue. Well, the way you deal with in, injections, you witness the fact that they're injective by writing a case analysis. Oh, so you just, so like there's yeah. kind of a, an yeah. implicit part if yeah. you list a bunch of constructors that you have to define yeah. that. So, um, when, so when you wrote your own, you must witness the injectivity by giving me the proof, which is the case analysis. So really every like data signature is going to, every data structure rather, is going to be kind of a pair where the first component is everything and then the second component is going to be, yeah, here's the alum form. Yeah, Okay. exactly. Very cool. Uh, I have that's, that, that's the idea. Thank you. That's a very good idea. But the partiality with, you know, mm -hmm. on Monday, Wednesday, and Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I love separating the effects from the values. On Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, I hate it. So today being Saturday, I condemn separating them. Uh, but uh, next week on Monday, I will think it's a good idea. I don't know what to do about this. There's, there's a need for a very good idea. Someone has to come up with a good idea to resolve this. The modal separation is terrible. The modal separation is wonderful. I don't have a stand. I cannot take a consistent stand. It depends on what I'm doing. It annoys the hell out of me. Uh, we lack a good idea. We need young people, creative people like you to come up with a good idea. I, I would be, I would, I would love to hear it. Can I do And you'll notice, you know, more. like in hat. Haskell has all this dogma, but they also have unsafe perform IO and it's there for a reason. Okay. So you see on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, they don't like it either. Or did I say Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday? Okay. Never mind the dogma. Okay. So the fact is, I don't know what to do. I'm going to go out on a limb and say this. 
the the grand story, the way I think the way that's going to resolve is we are eventually, and we're getting closer and closer all the time, to have an integration of verification with programming. And so what will happen is it's a matter of proving a theorem that a piece of code is pure. That's what I think is going to happen. And then there will need to be a way to like discharge that obligation and take advantage of the fact that you proved it. So I think something along those lines is what is needed. We need a good idea. Um, but, you know, an idea along those lines would be super helpful. And by the way, the very idea of call by need is a colossal cheat, is it not, right? It's a benign effect. Okay, so there's no way, no one can take a stand on this, oh, you should separate them, bullshit. <laughs> I wish I could, but I, I can't, I, I don't know what to do. And maybe the solution I suggest, something along those lines could be made to work. That's my best guess at the moment. I got a couple more questions queued up from chat, if that's all right. Yep. Um, so one is from Ben Logston. Um, the question is, could you give, it's kind of a high level question. Could you give a general explanation of what you mean by the term phase distinction um, in general? Um, maybe. What, I, what I mean, what I mean by if, could you define phase distinction or kind of give a general? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, it's extremely. It's in the paper, the parametricity structures paper. It's a coarsening of equality. That is the idea. It's it's the idea of an open and closed set and a topology. So that is what is that's what in a complementary closed set and topology. So this is exactly what is going on, and. Uh, uh, you know, the, in the paper there, it's it's explained in a number of different ways. Oh, also the place you can look is, uh, I guess about six months ago, question mark, uh, John Sterling, my student, uh, wrote a blog post on his blog about these ideas that is, you should read that, that it is a beautiful uh, account of the underlying, the underlying ideas that make all this, make all this run. Uh, so you should you should have a look at that. That's that's I think that's your best. John Sterling, uh, spelled more or less the way you think, but E R as opposed to I R in Scotland it would be I R, but S T E R. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. That's it. Somebody put it on the blog. <clears throat> oh, Harrison did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I imagine you're talking about the Topoi post, not the Per post. Say again, please. You're talking about the Topoi post, not the. Yeah, 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 post, yeah, okay. topic. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, because the it all comes from topos theory. That's the idea, and the idea about topos, the duality between topos and a logos. If you've heard about this, there's a recent paper by uh, Matthew Onel and Andres Royal, which is about a 95-page paper, which uh, surveys logos and topos theory. That's also a very, very useful resource. Uh, I have another no, question. I can, I can account for, no, I can account for reverse oh. effects. That's not, there's no issue there. No, there's no issue there. I, I can add state in my computations. I don't know. It would be a non-starter if I didn't have recursive types. So obviously, but anyway, uh, yes, no, of course I can have recursive types. Another question from chat. Uh, this one's from, <laughs> I hope I'm pronouncing this at least decently, uh, Guillermo Silva. Um, the question is, I read about TIML that does complexity analysis. Does this theory of complexity that you told uh, look like that? I don't know whose paper that is. Who are the authors? Not sure. Maybe the person who's asking the question can jump well, in. Well, anyway, we have, we have like an extensive related work section in the forthcoming paper, so I guess that will... That will, that will answer it. Okay. They just put a link in chat. Okay. The way I would do recursive types is a small type, but and put it in with effectful. Yeah, it's integrated with effectful. You can't unfold a recursive type. Unfolding recursive type is a computation, not a not a not a value. Um, that's that's the way that would be done. That way, if you induce non-termination by unfolding, then you will. Uh, it will be confined to the to the computation mode. Mm -hmm. 